Welcome to Liberty Baptist Church of Chicago for our first Women of Faith Conference. Uh, we are going to discuss today Mark 5, 21 through 34. We're going to go to the doorsteps of two women today, uh, Jairus' 12-year-old daughter and the woman with the issue of blood. I'm delighted to have a few of our facilitators here today. Um, and for those of you that are watching us today, we thank you for coming to this, our very first Women of Faith Fellowship. And so as we are discussing, as we move into this new arena of going to God's Word and talking about women in the Bible, uh, the first thing that we got to have to investigate is what I would call the cultural context of women in the Bible. So Sam, uh, pull that uh, slide up. It's very important for us to understand the cultural context of women in the Bible. Um, women in the Bible were considered less than men. There was no equality then. And let's face it, ladies, the 19, early 1900s, there was no equality in America. And there still is limited equality today. So when we are studying God's word from the historical cultural context, we cannot escape the fact of the position of women in the Bible, the cultural position in the Bible. So how did this, how did this get started? Well, it started in Genesis 3.16. In Genesis 3.16, that's when Eve was cursed to be subordinate to Adam uh, because she was the one who partook, who partook of the tree of life. Um, but prior to this passage, prior to Genesis 3.16, there is no indication of a woman's subordination to men. It's, it's as if Adam and Eve are on equal footing until that point, until that happens. So that's where this subjugation comes from. That's where uh, this less than status comes from, from the biblical text. But what is ignored is Genesis 3.17. We see Eve being cursed, but Adam was cursed too. Adam was cursed, and he was responsible for tilling the ground, taking responsibility for his family. But because of the patriarchy, we never really read 317 as Adam being cursed. But it was a dual curse. It was a curse for Eve to be subordinate, but it was a curse for Adam to support and till the ground for his family. The other thing that's ignored in the cultural context of the Adam and Eve Genesis account is that in Genesis 3, 6, when you read that, um, Adam was right there with Eve when it went down. And so God gives this curse of responsibility to Adam because when he calls out, Adam, where are you? He says, uh, I, I'm, not, I'm naked. You can't see me. And so God says, how do you know you're naked? And what does Adam do? Pass his buck. She did it. She did it, right? This woman you gave me, right? The one under the bus, right? And so what we see happening is God is saying, you didn't assume responsibility, now you got it all. Now you got it all. So, this, so we got to understand that when we read the biblical account, where women started, okay? Uh, Sam, go to the next slide. This is going to really kind of fuel our discussion, ladies, whether we are talking Old Testament or New Testament. This should, this should inform our discussion. Despite women being marginalized in a cultural context, it is interesting that when Jesus comes, although born into a male-dominated world, many of Jesus' divine moments are experienced with his encounters with women. A lot of Jesus' powerful moments, despite women being marginalized, and culture happen when he interacts with women. We really look at it, okay? And so despite this marginalization, let's just go to the very beginning. 
Here's a patriarchy, but what does Luke do? What does Luke do in Luke 1, 26 through 33? Um, Luke goes, the angel goes to Mary. Sam, are you there? The angel goes to Mary and tells Mary, you're going to be without child. This, the, and Matthew has him going to Joseph, right? Because Matthew is the patriarch. So Matthew's going to go to Joseph. But look at Luke. The discussion is had with Mary about her being impregnated by the Holy Spirit. So although marginalized in society, the angel stops by to have a conversation with Mary about this miracle that would eventually just change the world. As we keep looking at Jesus' interaction, and the reason I picked these is because we're seeing Jesus powerful interaction with women before he even hits the, he's even born in a major. Um, if you look at it, if you want to look at another piece, let's look at John the Baptist in the womb of his mother Elizabeth. Another Luke text, Luke 1, 39 through 42. The Bible says that John the Baptist in Elizabeth's belly leaps at the mere fact of Mary greeting his mother. So here are these two marginalized women that are indi indicative of the divinity of Christ even before he's born. Even before he's born. And so that this, that's an example of the encounters that we see. And so let's look at that. Let's look at that and we'll move on to the next thing because this lesson is not about that at all. This is just the introduction. Um, so what we see is Eve being cursed with labor pains, right? But Jesus coming in a very liberating fashion also through a woman under the power of the Holy Spirit. So what was then meant to be the curse, in many respects, the power of God, when Jesus comes, is being evident through that process. Right, right. right? So Jesus, so we consider Jesus, and, and it's no secret, Jesus is the great liberator. Uh, the great liberator from racial lines, the great liberator from gender lines, uh, and the great uh, uh, liberator uh, from, from like man and female relationships. So let's go to Gen, uh, Galatians 3, 27 through 28. Let's go by my favorite guy, Paul. Because of Jesus, Paul makes this statement. As many of you were baptized in Christ, have clothed yourselves with Christ, there is no longer Jew or Greek, there is no longer slave or free, there is no longer male and female, for all of you are one in Christ Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. There we see Jesus as the liberator. And so Jesus' encounters with women are liberating. They not only deliver, but they liberate. And anybody, if you want to just tell the truth, deliverance is liberation. Because you're being delivered from something. Right? And so Jesus is the great liberator. Now, I got to say it because of the world we live in. When I'm talking about gender, I'm not talking about the complex discussion we have today. I'm talking about us as all being equally human and humankind. Okay, that's, that's, that's our discussion uh, for today for someone that may be new to our church and our church's theology. So that's what we have as far as Jesus' encounters uh, with women. So now today, uh, you hit my Jesus, the liberator slide, Sam. Okay, because I totally messed up. I didn't tell you to turn it. But now you can turn to the next slide. Uh, we're going to get into our two passages today uh, that come from Mark 5, 21 through 34. We're going to talk about Jairus' daughter and the women with the issue of blood. Oftentimes, due to, we've heard these stories within a sermon context, and we really don't realize that the stories run congruently. So Jairus comes to Jesus and says, lay your hands on my daughter that she may be healed. The crowd hears it, and Jesus says, I'm going to your house. And now the crowd is actually following Jesus to Jairus' house. But on the way, they encounter the woman with the issue of blood. And then after that takes place, Jesus then proceeds to Jairus' house. And a lot of times, these 
these two stories are kind of read as independent, but they're both almost simultaneous encounters with Jesus and his liberating ability. And so when we, when we looked at this, Jairus' daughter, the woman with the issue of blood, uh, for our ladies that have been listening to me for 10 minutes and saying, well, why is he talking to the ladies? I've been doing this a long time. I check with the ladies. I check with the ladies, some of whom are here today. And so that's what your, your slide lets you know where some of this insight is coming from. Before I jumped out and got in front of you all, I asked some of our uh, uh, people who are studying in ministry and people already in ministry that are females in our church to give me their insights into this from a woman's perspective. What jumped out the pages at them? And so we want to give special thanks today to Dr. Felicia Cooper, who uh, is in the room with us today. Um, we want to thank Reverend Dr. Rosemary Hutton, who actually preached on this subject three months ago. She didn't know it, but I was taking notes. I was, I was taking notes because I said, I right, don't know it's coming, but that's coming. That's what we're going to talk about. And we want to thank Reverend Dr. Gwen Oliver uh, for their insight. So I took notes from Dr. Hutton, uh, her sermon, and then I took notes that Felicia, Dr. Cooper gave us, and Dr. Oliver gave us. Now, because I know we are a title-driven world, and I don't want confusion, I call Dr. Felicia Cooper, Dr. Cooper, because she has a pharmacy doctorate, Xavier University, am I correct? All right, so that's why she's Dr. Felicia Cooper, all right? All right, uh, she's, she's pursuing some the theological things, so we may be speaking things as though they were, but right now we're speaking them how they are, all right? All right, so that covers the whole title thing, I hope. All right, let's move on to the next slide. And this came from uh, Dr. Cooper, the parallels of the two healings, parallels of the two healings. Events, these are events that take place with the women with the issue of blood uh, and events that are taking place with Jairus' daughter. What I like about this sort of uh, sandwich, because it is a sandwich, right? It's Jairus, women with the issue of blood, and back to Jairus. So when I learned it in seminary, it told me like a sandwich type story. Uh, what's, what's powerful about this, and I hope that we have, those that are listening, days later, I hope you've invited your teenagers out. Hope you invited your 7th and 8th graders out. This is a multi-generational experience. Yes, yes, yes. This is a 12-year-old and a grown woman. And it's showing us that Jesus is encountering women across a spectrum. Not only of social status, but of age. So that's why this was set for the first lesson, because we want to ingratiate the younger ladies in the church. Guess what? Not even the young ladies in your church. Is it a young lady that lives on your block that you talk to? She should be in here today. All right. And if she's not in this one, hopefully she's in the next one. So let's look at these parallels and then we'll move on. J.R.S. daughter was 12 years old. Uh, the woman with the issue of blood had the illness for 12 years. Um, their healing and their, their relationships were a little bit different. Jairus' daughter required an advocate. The woman with the issue of blood was her own advocate. Um, Jairus' daughter was counted out. Uh, the women with the issue of, of blood, uh, the doctors were unable to help her, which counted her. Uh, one was dead. One was dead to society. Okay. One had a premature death, and one was dead due to a loss of error. Um, one was revived when Jesus touched her, and one was revived when she touched Jesus. So these are kind of the parallels, and we'll be kind of walking you guys uh, through this for the next maybe 20 minutes or so. Um, so what is the first lesson that we learned? I'm big on, I'm big on numbers. All right, I'm big on numbers. Our deacons can tell you that, especially the numbers as Christians, not because I'm an accountant. There's a smarty pants that says, not because I'm an accountant, but uh, that may be a little bit. But three, seven, and 12s. If you watch what goes around here in the church, I do everything in three, sevens, and 12s. If we don't have 12 deacons here on Sunday, for first Sunday, it's seven. If we don't have seven, it'll be three. 
See, that's stuff y'all don't see that's happening. Because it's 3, 7, and 12 are signs of completion. And, and God has worked in those numbers, 3, 7, 12. All right? And so what's interesting about this is the number 12. Both have 12 years old, 12 years with illness. Completion. And so what we want to share with you all on this first nugget from this lesson today with these two ladies is this. God will complete his purpose for you. In a predetermined time. God completes his purpose. So what is that purpose? What is that purpose? We reading this 2,000 years later. Their, their purpose was that for their life was that we could be blessed today. Completion. And so that's what we need to realize. That's what we see by that number 12 being present with these ladies. That whatever we're going through, God will complete the work he has in us. Let's go back to my favorite person, Paul. Philippians 1, 6. Paul says this, I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. Amen. Amen. So you say, huh? there's, no, there's been no good works in my life. Yes, they are. The day you were born was a good work. Hallelujah. And so God is, wants to bring that good work of your life to completion. Even if you got to wait 12 years for it to happen. Right? Completion. All right? Uh, Sam, you got that? Okay. All right. Um, let's move on to the next slide. And this one is going to focus on Jairus' daughter. We want you to know, when we look at these texts, and, and encountering, we, we're trying to get to encounter Jesus to the fullest, right? That's what I want to do. I want to encounter Jesus to the fullest. Yeah. And can I give you a newsflash? I won't do it till I get to heaven, but I'm sure trying. Okay. Okay. So all of us in here, no matter how old we are, how long we've been in church, we should be striving to encounter Jesus to the fullest. And so what we learn, in order to do that, what we learn from Jairus' daughter is that our relationships matter all right our relationships matter we have to surround ourselves and have true believers in our lives so when we look at Jairus's daughter as was, as was discussed at your first slide she had an advocate her advocate was her father her father came to Jesus and said lay your hands so that she may be made well. Now let me walk you through without taking too much time. The gravity of this episode. We're talking about the sandwich. But let's talk about what happened before that. Jesus has now come back from Gadarene. Where he healed the demoniac. He's now back on the shores. He's back very popular. For his power and his healing. So you say oh he just came back. Well, let's, let's go back a little further. Before that, that's when he feeds the multitude. They're pressing on him. Right? They're pressing on him so bad, they get on the ship and they go to the other side. And when they go to the other side, he runs in to the demoniac and he heals them. But what happens as they're going to the other side? Y'all remember that storm that happened in the boat? So Jesus gets up and says, peace be still. Now, does that help you? Does that help you now the magnitude of understanding? Now when he comes back, can you see the guys on the boat saying, y'all know what this dude just did? Right. And this the same dude that fell the multitude. Y'all know what this dude just did? He just healed the demoniac. So it would make sense that Jairus, a leader of the synagogue, says, I got to advocate for my daughter because there's something about this Jesus. Yes, yes, yes. So he's, he's, he's advocating for his daughter and he's saying, Master, if you come, just lay hands on her. And then Jesus says, I'll go. That's an advocate. We all need advocates that can go to God on our behalf and say, lay hand, they need your help. My friend needs your help. My child needs your help. Uh, watch this. We learn about relationships from Jesus. We know Jesus could do anything, right? Jesus performed a miracle. He had fed all them people. He stopped the ship full of a bunch of sailors who probably didn't all know who he was. But watch what Jesus does here with Jairus' daughter. He doesn't let all of them, all the disciples don't go with him. He picks Peter, 
James and John. Three. Three. He picks three that were closest to him to go. So even for whatever reason, not that Jesus couldn't do it with 12, but he chose three because those relationships matter. Now, when Jairus, they get to Jairus's house, and when they get there, they're saying, she dead. Can you see a good church folk? She dead. I don't know why y'all came. Uh, if, if, if Jesus was a pastor, pastor, you should have came a little bit earlier. <laughs> right? They had this, they out there crying and all that. Jesus says, she's not dead, she's asleep. They laugh at Jesus. Relationships matter. What did Jesus do? All he get out the house. Because we got to have some believers in the house. Some stuff needs to come to completion. And I got to have some believers in the house. So the Bible says it was just history, her mother and her father. That was it. Ladies, your relationships matter. Um, I am one man in the house of three ladies. And uh, at some point, I finally got a male dog in my house. I'm on number two. <laughs> Francis and Snowball. But before that, I had Dolly. And it was everything was going was towards the feet. And so I want, and I, as a man, I'm not going to tackle that, but you, I want you guys to think about what your relationships are. What are your relationships? Because those relationships matter. And I learned being in the house with three ladies that relational relationships between men and women to some degree can be different. Right? Now some, some feminists would hate that I'm saying that, but it is what it is. It is, I've had eyewitness see. And I'm not saying it's good or bad, but our relationships matter. Okay? Uh, they matter very much. And there's difference, there's difference between, no, we're going to wait to the end. We're going to wait to the end. All right. I'm going to give you all my clothes before I get there. I ain't going to do it. All right. We're going to keep moving. Your relationships matter. The next thing, as we look at the woman with the issue of blood, how do we navigate through the crowd? Say, I'm pull up that slide. Navigating through the crowd. Because we talked about Jesus. Because now can you imagine how hyped this crowd is? Right. This is not no regular. This is like taste of Chicago, can't do, get through traffic kind of crowd. <laughs> so she's out in the crowd. But she's around all these people. But yet, she feels alone. She's in a crowd, but yet she's alone. Why? Because as a woman, society dictated that she should not be there. Because the Leviticus account, Leviticus 3, suggests that if a woman was on her menstrual, she was not supposed to go outside. So the, the under, see, that's not, you know, back in the day, we just read women with the issue of blood, she touched the hem of his garment. But growing up, nobody ever talked about how she was considered to be unclean. That's, that's almost more powerful related to her faith than her touch the hem of the garment. Because she got out there against social, cultural standards. And so there are things that you all grapple with. And, and now it may not be as intentional as unintentional or subliminal. The world has said, you shouldn't be here. And so even though you're in the crowd, you can feel alone. Your issues can make you feel alone. Because there's no room to go out and express those issues with the world, right? So that's the first thing. So as she's navigating, she's navigating very powerfully because she's alone in the crowd. And if y'all know if you ever had that in your life, but you can be alone in the crowd. All right? But as she navigates through the crowd, what do we have to do in this encounter with Jesus? Good news, y'all. Press through the crowd regardless of the world's labels. Despite all that, she said, I'm out here now. If I could just touch the hem of his garment. So she pressed her way through the crowd despite what labels are on you. Might not be an issue of blood, but what labels are on you? Press through the crowd despite the labels. 
And what, what, what can be crowdedness in our lives? Life can be crowded. Family can make our lives crowded. Work can make our lives crowded. Interaction with others in the patriarchy, like me, not like me, but you know, my brothers, you know what I'm saying? That pressing through that mess. But here's, here's one for you good church folk. Church could be crowded. And in, as we press our way as liberty to a new day, there should be nothing happening here on Sunday from 11 to 1230 that's so important you don't try to experience Jesus. All right. All right. Amen. Drop what you're doing, hour and a half, because sometimes we allow church busyness and our need to be important in church have us miss yes. Yes. what we're here for. Yes. Yes. And that goes for Wednesday. Whatever you're doing on Wednesday, drop it. Now, I hate to say it, but it is what it is. New streaming day. If you want to drop it on Tuesday and watch Wednesday, fine. But drop it. Work through the crowdness, right? We have technology now that really makes it no excuse for us to drop one hour during the week to do these things, right? So be careful about that. If you're navigating through the crowd, be careful of the crowd you create. That you put making her priority. Um, the next thing that she does, we kind of already alluded already. She was not simply satisfied being in the crowd. She had to touch him. Not just satisfied being. I want to experience. I want to encounter Jesus. I don't just want to see Jesus. I want to encounter Jesus. Right? Some of us would have been in the crowd and said, Jesus can hear. Hey, leave me. Heal me. She, that wasn't good enough for her. She had to. So when, when we in the crowd, we feel alone. But don't feel alone. Press our way through the crowd and of life. And when you're in the crowd, you might as well seek to have an encounter. So if you're in the church sanctuary, you might as well look to have an encounter. Hallelujah. A hand clap, a tear, a head shake, a sunk. Right? If you experience, if you really want to experience, experience God. All right, Sam, let's... Uh, Move on to the next. This is how we're still with the woman with the issue of blood. Um, I want to encourage you all further. When we encounter Jesus, Jesus responds in crowded situations. He responds to her, right? So sometimes you think you're in the crowd. Jesus don't know nothing about you, right? He ain't about you. All the stuff God got to do with the whole world. Why he worrying about your light bill? Your kids, your health. Well, he, why would he worry about that? Jesus responds in crowded situations. Jesus can feel and meet your needs while you're in the crowd. Jesus wants you in the crowd regardless of the world's limitations, even those that claim to love God will limit you. That's what the, the patriarchy did. They were limiting her presence. But Jesus decided to respond to her. And how do he respond? Verse 27 in Mark 5 says, somebody touch me. He responded. Very specific response. Just everybody was touching him, y'all. Everybody was touching him. But that specific, despite that crowded situation, Jesus is saying, I'm going to zero in on you. Like a spotlight coming on her situation. God desires to do that when we encounter Jesus. When he breaks the chains that have been uh, stifling us. Then after Jesus touches you, watch this thing guys. Verse 34. You move from touching to an encounter. So we can play semantics. I ain't touching an encounter. Technically, but there's a, so let's go with a heightened encounter. Because after uh, Jesus says, somebody touch me, the account says she gets nervous. Because she ain't got no business being out there. And she knows that he knows. Right? But then she gets enough, st enough gumption to say, it's me. I'm the one that touched it. And then, so she moved from just touching to an encounter. Because then he affirms what he did. 
your faith has made you well. Yes, 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 the affirmation, the encounter. Now I'm encountering, right? Because I can go right to God and say, it's me. I did this. He already knows. But he wants to hear you say, I did not said your faith. And so, watch this now. She had already been made well. The text says, as soon as, as, soon as she touched him, it stopped. But Jesus just wanted to affirm. Jesus is saying, now that you've encountered me, just in case you think I haven't done something in you, <laughs> yes, yes. it's done. Yes, Lord. So you move from the simple touch to that encounter, and Jesus will respond in those crowded situations. All right. So now we go to the end of the sandwich. I don't know if you like Big Macs or not. So we did the top, now we got the meat, we done put the lettuce. Now we got like the last patty with the last piece of bread for the Mark 5 Big Mac, all right? So with Mark 5 Big Mac, let's, now let's carry some lessons from Jairus' daughter. And this is a very complex thing and some of our groups are gonna have to navigate through, but we need to be aware of this. And it's going to sound like an oxymoron. When you are dead, you do not know it. She didn't know she was dead. She was just dead. Okay? And so this is why you need an advocate. Because sometimes you run out of gas and you don't know it. And you need people who are around you that can tell you out of gas. You know, because oftentimes we can be, well, not we because I'm a guy, but since this is the woman's session, we can be dead and walking. You can be functioning. You can be a good church lady. You put on your white for the first Sunday. You put on your black for the funeral and yet still be dead. So when we look for our advocates, when we look for our spiritual health, uh, we need to understand and fall, watch out for that trap of being dead and not knowing. So we can be dead and not know it. So, we, I don't want you guys to start a discussion about how I know I'm dead. I just told you, if you're dead, you don't know it. <laughs> okay? So, cut that discussion. That happened from the first time I talked to class. But, because I had some time to think about it. But what we can identify when we encounter Jesus, what's killing you? You ain't dead yet. What's killing you? What's got you staying up all night? Who got who you worrying over that's killing you. So you need to address that before you find yourself dead. Mm -hmm. And that's that internal thing in you. Can't get it from me. Can't get it from you. Be honest when you go to bed at night. What is this thing that's killing you? It's not on my paper where Paul said, I let nothing separate me from the love of God. What's killing you? So you're not in that dead and don't know it phase where you'll need that advocate and that's why I'm your pastor because I if I need to see that I can see that sometimes and pray you know that's in, the, in our leaders you know that's what we're here for but uh, you dead we identify what's killing you um, an encounter with Jesus next lesson we learn is that an encounter with Jesus has power over death and so I got here, cancel your funeral. Whatever is supposed to have knocked you out, whatever should have just broke you down, cancel it. Because this encounter with Jesus has power over that. And on Dr. Cooper's slide, uh, we, we talked about the women with the issue of blood, more importantly, finances, loss, depression, whatever that is, cancel it. Because Jesus cancels that. He cancels that. When we, when we encounter Jesus genuinely. Um, the next, next one, well, let's go through them first. When you're dead, you do not know it. An encounter with Jesus has power over death. So when you encounter, cancel the funeral. Cancel those negative thoughts. Them people outside the house, you dead. I ain't dead. I'm about to get up. That's, that should be your thought pattern. Right? Cancel your funeral. Here's the last one. When you are raised from the dead, and you, by now y'all know I ain't talking about physical death, and you encounter Jesus, don't dwell on it, live life. All right, all right, yeah. 
Get up, stop walking, start walking, and get something to eat. Look at the text, what happened? When she got up, the Bible says she started walking, and Jesus said, go get her something to eat. And look why we cleared the room. Had to clear the room because if good church people were there, you know what they would have said? You sure was dead, girl. <laughs> I'm going to tell you how dead you were. Your daddy went to go find Jesus, and we thought they were never going to come back. And by the time he came back so late, you was dead. <laughs> that how we do. That's how we do. So they all need that negative energy. That only thing said, get up. She got up and walked and got something to eat. Because she didn't know she was dead. She probably thought she was sleeping. She getting up. And what did Jesus say? And by the way, don't tell nobody. Don't tell nobody. God, some, sometimes everything that happens to you ain't for everybody to know. Because they didn't really want you to come out of it no way. And that goes back to that relationship thing. But that's why. Clear the house. Get up. Go get something to eat. Text don't say nobody even dwelled on the fact she was dead. We dwelled on the fact she's alive. Yes, hallelujah. We got to dwell on the fact that we are alive. Yes. When we encounter Jesus. I don't care what you ladies have gone through today. What brought you here today. I'm excited that you are alive. I don't care about your episodes of death. I'm excited about your episode of life today. And further life. Get up. Get you something to eat. And keep it on, keep on moving, all right? So those are our lessons from uh, Jairus' uh, daughter. So now we're going to have quick questions for a reflection that you all are going to talk about in your breakout groups. You're going to go through as many questions as you can, but each of your facilitators has been assigned a question uh, for you all to present to the larger body a little later. And so let us go through our questions for a reflection. Sam, pull up the first slide for questions for a reflection. We all good? All right, questions for us to consider. Have you ever walked around like the woman with the issue of blood, feeling hopeless, isolated, and unworthy? How did you come out of it? For those of us that came out of it, we want to hear how you came out of it. For those of you that's in it, we'll pray about that for you, okay? But I think we need to learn the lessons of victory. How did you come out? All right, second question. Do you have prayer advocates in your life? How do you discern the difference between a prayer advocate and a friend? Your best friend may not be your prayer advocate. Sorry. No, you love your best friend. My prayer is your best friend every morning. But that ain't your prayer advocate. Not necessarily. Not necessarily is the better word. Your prayer advocate. All right. Um, next question. As we, as we tackle the women with the issue of blood. What are your issues? Are they specific to your life as a woman or are they general issues? Uh, because one thing that we got to acknowledge, women and men can't have the same issues, right? But, so, but some, it might be specific stuff specific to your womanhood or just to your a part of a human uh, kind. Um, if resolve, how did resolve regard the issue for you? question that we just talked about earlier what is killing your spirit that's the next slide Sam have you ever lived life as a dead woman walking and how has God delivered you and if you determine you ain't delivered yet that's all right that's the purpose of the lesson for you to evaluate that um, then two very simple questions if you can relate to Jairus' daughter, please explain. And that's any way the Lord gives you. If you can relate to the woman with the, to the, woman with the issue of blood, please explain. Uh, we have had a wonderful, wonderful first Women of Faith Fellowship, Jairus' daughter, and the woman with the issue of blood. You all have wonderful sessions. Uh, I'm talking to y'all here. I'm not going to be with y'all in person. Uh, because you all need this space to talk woman to woman, girl to woman, and girl to girl. God bless you. We hope you enjoyed the lesson.